Hello, my name is Adam Bean and welcome to the 81st edition of uh, Airhex TV, the very last in 2020. So the next one is going to be in 2021. So let's begin with the topics. The problem I have is I got uh, twice as many questions, which is great, but we have not, not a lot of, of time because I have a, a podcast assignment after the show and it's already scheduled with um, USA, so different time zones. Okay, before we really start, what um, I tried the very first time here is the chat, which comes from the AHEX TV side, which I don't like to show you right now because uh, um, probably internet will break down because I will see myself streaming. <laughs> so AHEX TV. So welcome all in the chat. I, I would say we should prefer this chat over the uh, free note uh, because it's a little bit outdated, I would say. The, you know, the uh, cool kids like JavaScript programmers or Python programmers are still on Freenode. We Java developers maybe moved on, of course, on something beautiful as this chat here. <laughs> okay, so let's start with uh, with the show. So let's um, hi, say hi to all you see is live and online. Okay, um, so very first um, topic uh, are actually, or oh, um, of course, Note on the Hex Live is going to be this week. I sent the invitations twice um, via Blue Jeans, this is the software, and via email. So uh, I got lots of questions when I sent you know the notifications. Now they are out. So this both workshop will take place this week. If you really would like to attend, uh, the best would be if you register via Meetup or uh, Eventbrite, or yeah, in 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 worst case, just register from here. I will manage to send you invitations still. But I, I would like, I already wanted to close the workshop. We have already 30 attendees and this is um, this is uh, enough, I would say, but a, a few seats will still work. And this workshop in the um, in spring is um, already well attended. So uh, it is guaranteed to run. So there are, I think, more than 10 attendees already. So it should be fun as well. So this is that. Then the next thing is um, our apologies. So I actually really... Uh, looked forward to the JLove conference. As you can see, this is supposed to be me. I'm, I'm, I don't, I'm, I don't know whether this is actually similar or not. But um, um, my my, or it this actually is because I thought my 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 hair is uh, darker here. But what happened was the following: I worked for a client via VPN, and I tried, you know, at the entire day and forgot about that. And try, you know, to to connect to the conference, and it didn't work because this was on a uh, public internet. And I thought, okay, why is it not working? And I thought my setup is wrong and I completely forgot that entire day I spent without internet, just, you know, hacking, trying to find some performance issues for a, uh, a Jakarta or Java e application. And I missed actually the session. So sorry for that. I really hate that, but it happened. And this is actually a great topic. So what I will do is I will offer the JLF conference, you know, to stream it again and promote the conference. So it's called... Um, J Love, so lots of great speakers, and I think I was the only one who missed the show. It's called J Love, and if you couldn't attend this this year, try to attend the next year. Um, great, great conference. And um, so on on that note, so what I will do is I will ask you know the uh, the uh, the organizer, and if it says okay, it's too late, then probably what I can do, I can probably either uh announce it on uh, on um on other conference so i can reuse the topic i don't like to speak about the same topics over and over again or an even better idea i got it right now if you are organizer of java user group and you would like you know to uh, talk me about this topic so we can do an online event but let's uh, see what happens i will i will send them an email again and propose that and if this does not work out um then uh, i will ask the java user groups and this is how i could give this back and this is really sorry for that so but something similar happened to me at the uh, java day istanbul conference but this was not my fault what happened was and this is just an um, advice to you for if you have some live streaming events i forgot the software they used but uh, I, I i had to use chrome and i have uh, several cameras attached like on my screen and the real camera and um and uh, chrome didn't allow me to select the camera and I couldn't join the session without the right camera running. And I didn't knew about that. And I tried and tried and tried and didn't work. And then I used you know, this exactly this link and I streamed 
the conference over this uh, this link. So um, what I learned after the show, there was another conference, and um, and you should use Firefox. It works as well as Chrome, and you can select the cameras. So this is how. Um, this was the uh, explanation why I couldn't deliver through this conference, but it was in September. And so looking back at 2020, what I, what I did uh, as a retrospective, um, I delivered the most conferences ever. Uh, I had the most projects ever with zero traveling, which is amazing. And uh, what I um, underestimated, um, yeah, uh, or, or overestimated the impact. So I thought, okay, this year I will have plenty of time, you know, for open source projects, fun projects, and at absolutely no time because there was zero traveling, zero downtime. And yeah, this is what uh, I completely, you know, um, yeah, um, how to call it? Yeah, overestimated, you know, or uh, underestimated the impact of traveling of my dead time, which I partially used, you know, for fun projects. Okay, so this was the bad news. And sorry again for that. And uh, so I can close actually my blog. And was the very first uh, topic and this i actually wanted to cover this the last time but um, um it was already too late and i got a great great feedback from uh mr christo stoyanov from irvine ca california and he actually attended or online downloaded my um my course and this is the course with the name web Op web components with uh, Redux and Lit HTML, and um, if you're curious about you know the source code behind, you can absolutely download it from uh, or download the source code from. Uh, it's actually exactly this. This is the website from GitHub, so the sources are completely free, and I use the applications to, uh, for uh, to announcing events on my blog. So I'm actually using it in in production. So, and. What he did is uh, he provided me a great constructive feedback. And what I did in the uh, workshop, I used Redux. And there is another thing called Redux Toolkit. The interesting part is that the Redux Toolkit is not an extension or, oh no, sorry. It is not a complete different framework. It actually builds upon uh, or builds on Redux. And for me as Java developer, this is actually a de more or less decorator pattern. And um, I'm actually using Redux Toolkit in my current co commercial project, but I still believe that it was the right choice to use it in the course. And I still believe that I would still start with Redux Plain, no Redux Toolkit in projects with Java developers who uh, have no um, prior experience with the web. So why that? Because Redux is a little bit chatty, but that obvious. It's like, you know, Java Singleton with three methods and you are basically done. So what Redux Toolkit does, it wraps um, and, and introduces more convenience, which um, is not obvious at the beginning what happens behind the scenes. For instance, it introduces kind of like, um, how would you call it, a, uh, I would say, action factory, which produces actions on the fly, which is convenient, but uh, confusing at the beginning. And um, I'm not sure about, uh, so I, some things I really like about the Redux toolkit, for instance, it registers automatically the, uh, the Redux tooling in the Chrome browser, which we did actually manually in the workshop. Or um, what it does is it maintains the keys for the switch statements, which is great. But um, still, I'm not really sure whether this is the right approach for all projects. And what you can absolutely do, you can start with Redux and then move on with Redux toolkit. So the next thing is what I always do in my projects. I use uh, the boundary control entity pattern, and also if in the front end, it's actually exactly the same idea as the back end. But in front end, I'm a little bit more restrictive because what I what I tend to have is one to one mapping between view and the package. And what uh, what uh, forgot his first name, what uh, Christo. Uh, what what Christo recognized that sometimes I have messy imports and there are lots of um, controls which um, yeah but in uh, real projects my controls are a lot larger the problem with the workshop project it was too simple in real uh, life applications the controls are larger and they are also calling uh, each other sometimes uh, to uh, to uh, reuse stuff which happens naturally is very similar to uh, to Java so I keep using the um, my Jav Javanese approach and the duck module pattern, I can show you this, uh, 
uh, oh, this was a private, so it was um, it um, it is like where it is. They bundle everything in one module and expose that. Where was it? But I don't like actually the approach at all, and I think I wouldn't be very successful teaching Java developers to use this pattern. So this is what um, I actually don't like it. So it's not like I have um, so the duck module pattern on on paper is a lot better than my approach, but I don't like how it feels. So it is like you no know, subjective answer. But um, if you would use it already in projects, I will adapt to it and use it. So this is what I can tell you. Uh, yeah. And um, he says that for, for people new to Redux, it's worth spending some time explaining why you need Redux, Redux Toolkit. I think this is feedback to the course. What I mean is that I didn't spend too much time, probably. Um, I could spend more time you know, um, uh, introducing uh, Redux, but the problem with my course is I try not to code the entire time. So there's not a lot of time to uh, for the theory. And I hope that if you see what I'm doing, then it's clear why, why it happens, right? So, and then a very good feedback because what happened with Snowpack, I think in the course I still use Snowpack 1 and now it's Snowpack 2 on uh, already. And the Snowpack 2, it is like a combination of the Snowpack 1 with Browser Sync. And I don't like it, I, I would say it is, I, don't, I, I like it less than the first version. And what I already did in my current projects, I, I'm, I'm using in my commercial project right now, just plain uh, rollup. And it works, I think, almost as good as the um, uh, Snowpack. And what uh, uh, Christo su suggests here, instead, what I did in this course, I had an index.js file with all the imports. And this is how I teach um, Snowpack to pick the right dependency. And what he suggests is to, to, uh, to install the dependencies explicitly in, in package.json. So I tried that in my current rollups uh, uh, approach, and I still like the index.js better. So also rollup uh, supports both. The reason being is because what you can usually do in project, just copy from get it started the input statements directly to the index.js file and you are done. But Christo, thank you for your, for your feedback. I spend actually a lot of time to implementing your ideas and, and think about that. So, um, and what happened is, um, yeah, I'm using now Redux Toolkit in my commercial projects and I don't use the module pattern and I don't use um, Snowpack. I fall back to uh, Rollup. And what I plan to do is, this is why actually I give you one month later the uh, feedback than, than, uh, than uh, originally uh, planned. The reason being is, uh, because what I wanted to do is to um, uh, record some bonus episode for the course with uh, Rollup, but I had absolutely no time. So it's like end of year is this crazy uh, projects, deadlines are hunting me. So, but I will do it. So I will record a series, you know, maybe even with uh, Redux Toolkit and bonus material completely free on the uh, Vimeo course, um, web components with Redux and um, lit HTML. Okay, so now... Uh, done. Next topic is a friend of the show, Josef Mader-Kreiner, uh, a friend from Austria, or uh, no, uh, uh, Java developer from Austria, and uh, he asked me about Jakarta Batch. So, um, so um, I get these questions a lot, so people ask me about my opinion about Jakarta Batch, and um, so I evaluated a couple of times and never used that actually in commercial projects. And the reason were, uh, um, we always found a, is a Java SE solution and very easy Java E solution to um, which was uh, simpler than the Java E batch. And if you take a look at the Jakarta E batch specification, what um, this is Jakarta E batch, and um, what it already states, it is all about uh, checkpoints, restarts, XML configuration, which is persisted uh, persisted on a central location. So the idea is that um, you actually model, you know, the entire process where uh, this is the processing nodes and they could, you know, be uh, executed in parallel, then join the efforts. And if something breaks, it can be restarted. And um, so the restart thing, this is probably a thing, but we never had, you know, to model the process in XML or stuff like that. And um, so 
having said that, what uh, what I did is once in one project, I use my uh, I introduce a project called let's see whether I can find that. I think it's this one. Yeah, it's called Enhydrator. So uh, my client asked me to pro to implement, you know, uh, a Java E solution back then, and it was already probably yeah, six years ago. And what I did instead, I created the Enhydrator project, which is still operational. So you can just take a look. And um, what the Enhydrator did is, this was like a Java SE solution to transform data back and forth. And they wanted to implement this as Java e, Java batch, and this was not even Java E. So um, this is this one. So um, I would say. It if you need you know the uh, the the power of Java E batch where you uh, specify in XML the entire flow you need to restart do it. Um, otherwise, I would took a look, try to you know to achieve the same with MicroProfile, Open Liberty, Quarkus, or Heridons stuff like that, and um, it's usually good enough. So and uh, what you're asking me is there a cloud native support of Jakarta batch? So I don't know what you mean by that because. Uh, servers like let's say Payara, Whitefly, Open Liberty are cloud net, net. There's nothing lacking. So right now I'm using in a project Payara, in another project Quarkus, and both are cloud native. So Payara supports MicroProfile config, uh, Quarkus supports MicroProfile config. Um, and I mean, this is really hard to tell what cloud native actually means. But um, um, you could absolutely use Jakarta e J Java Java e batch or Jakarta e batch on Payara on Kubernetes or Open Liberty in Kubernetes. So the second question is my second question is your opinion of uh, Open Genai, and he says, okay, Open Liberty uses Open Genai. I used Open Liberty on Open JDK usually, and um, do you think it's ready for a production environment? Uh, absolutely, it is. I mean, this is very nature um, major. Um, JDK or Java, and uh, uh, it comes from IBM, and Open Liberty comes from I IBM, so you can use both. And um, your, I know your projects are more serious. Um, I, I know your uh, your, <laughs> your area, but so what I would say is probably you have already support for Open Liberty, and if you have support for Open Liberty, you probably also have support for Open G9. So um, just use it, and um, and Open G9 is a little bit faster. Then um, Open JDK is not like a huge difference; it's a little bit. So, um, the, so, so why not? Um, a reason uh, why not would be that the Open G9 ships with different. Um, it's a different JVM, so um, this would be the reason why not to use Open G9. So it means uh, um, uh, flags and settings you know from Hotspot may not apply to Open G9. This is the one of the reasons not to use Open G9. But since you are already using Open Liberty and you are IBM shop, just go with Open G9. And so why shouldn't we use GraalVM? So GraalVM is a completely different story. GraalVM is less interesting for, for uh, I would say, as, as, as Java runtime and more interesting for, for uh, running this in a native mode. And this is what I wouldn't use right now if it's not necessary because um, this is no more Java you know, right? This is like... Uh, a, a transpiled version of Java running as a native image. So, Yusuf, thank you. Now, the old friend of the show and friend of the chat, the maintainer of the chat, is there any place with all documentations for Jakarta? You are trying to find Eclipse org pages, but without success. So, you see, uh, what happened during JLove? I think I explained that. Um, so, I was not, I didn't even start at JLove, right? So, so, but um, yeah, um, actually, if you go to Jakarta E uh, and specifications, so then you are in. I mean, this is that simple as is easier than before, right? So uh, you have the uh, Jakarta e batch, and this is the uh, Jakarta e is Jakarta batch is not as um, as complete as let's say go here. What is you find Jakarta e one one concurrency with HTML. So I would say it's absolutely one place with uh, most of the specs. So, and uh, back then it was JCP, so it was very similar. And and they will uh, th this place becomes more and more complete. And there is, I'm just curious what you can download here. Probably Glassfish. Uh, no, you see specific. Oh, specification. Okay, and we also have download compatible products. And okay, so there are. This is these are the downloads. Um, 
Okay. Next one. Friend of the show, uh, Brad Tucker. So uh, he attended the the actual air hacks at Munich Airport, I would say three years ago or four years ago. And he was a great uh, friend of the uh, of the Glühwein. So this word in Glühwein is like glowing wine. And he tried to replicate the experience in Utah, but uh, I it looked like Glühwein, but it, I don't know how it tasted. And um, he, he's asking me something interesting. I learned, um, yeah, here, my question to you, what do you do when it's time when do you know uh when it's time to learn something new um or when do you do what do you do when it's time to learn something new what resources do you use when you first sat down to start learning about web components for example so and um i would say i'm i'm very easy to predict because um my uh, as i started with java or let's say um started for with uh, c++ maybe this was a uh, uh, less obvious but the first thing i did i just started you know to to, to, to think about um who is behind c plus plus and back then for me it was obvious this is beyond strustrup uh, beyond strustrup so what i did is i book uh, i bought the books from beyond strustrup and tried to understand you know how c plus c plus plus works and then um th this is how i learned c plus plus um then java came out and for me it was java soft so it was and then java soft became sun microsystems or sun or java soft was like in an and an, an subsidiary of sun sun microsystems but for me it was obvious that um java if you i would like to learn java i have to follow sun microsystems and um and uh, then it was also obvious um i just do know the java se programming and uh, if I need servers, then I go to Sun, take a look at the servers, and there were application servers. So I pick the application servers and will use them unless something won't work, right? So this was the uh, uh, if it works is great, but if it doesn't, um, then I will pick something else. And um, so it was if I would back then do some mobile programming, I would pick I would start with Java ME first, and if it doesn't work, pick something else. And, and I did it actually, right? I used Java FX uh, was for me the the choice, and not other frameworks like back then Flex or Flash, um, uh, because uh, and and I had lots of discussion in project why I didn't use Flex or Flash, um, because I said okay, Java FX ships with uh, Java, um, why not use it? And and it was almost that, but it is back again, right? Java FX um, is almost. Um, there is new killer killer use cases not available before with combination with Graal VM where you can build native applications and push Java FX applications to uh, iOS and Android app stores. I would say for Java developers, a, a great way to, to create native applications and develop them actually on the desktop in Java. So um, th this is uh, what I always did. I followed, you know, the, 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 the companies behind the technology. So what it means is, um, if I would be a database um, Oracle developer, then I would, of course, try to, you know, to learn from Oracle first before I go to other resources to learn about the Oracle uh, database. W what I actually did, so back then I also used our Oracle database a lot, so I bought the first books were actually Oracle books. So what I remember were gray books with no red stripe. It was like the Oracle databases books. So, um, and uh, what do you do when it's time to learn something new or how i know that this uh, something new is uh, is necessary so um what worked well or i was lucky i ignored a lot of stuff and this stuff i ignored it died and what usually i ignored was framework which were not you know from the source and um so it's a little bit more boring but for me it is exciting because i started in java in 1995 and i still have fun with java and i, I know you know lots of developers who became managers which is a good sign or not, I don't know, but um, I still have fun with Java and I, I don't, it's not like, you know, I have to, to, to read the entire internet uh, every day. I just, there are just incremental changes to the Java language and, uh, and even Jakarta or MicroProfile is not like it changes all the time. This is one of the, of the uh, advantages. So, and then you ask me, what resource did you use when you first sat down to start learning about web components, for example? So, what I knew is that um, JavaScript will win over Swing. So this is what I knew. But 
uh, prior to JavaScript 2000 and what was it uh, ES 2015. So it was you know be, uh, prior to when JavaScript became to look like Java. I was absolutely not interested to learning this because I knew that there's no way it will fly. And we said this is impossible that the web developers or Java developers we will have you know to 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 use module pattern to have you know packages like you know IFs and stuff crazy stuff like that. It was if I showed this to Java developers, everyone called me crazy. So okay, and the um, so if you have something like this, if you show someone a technology and they say okay, just forget it. I, I mean this is um, then you properly know that it will won't fly. So but now if I show them you know web components or ES6, it dev actually Java developers are pleasantly surprised. How much can you achieve without frameworks? So, so what, what for me means, I, I understand this is the future. So what I really know right now is that the web components and CSS this without external dependencies should actually win. Whether they will is really hard to tell. Stupid stuff can happen. But right now they are extremely productive. And if you don't need a lot of frameworks and libraries to be productive, this is always a good sign. So if you need, you know, for your productivity, millions of frameworks, tools, and magic, I would say forget it, right? So, so I sat several times down to learn web components because I knew this is like a, a part of the web standards platform. But for instance, uh, I forgot the version of Polymer, but the old Polymer for me, it was not usable. The framework was crazy. It was way too complicated. So I started several times and then gave up. So, okay, so no, this is, uh, this is, uh, the time is not right now. And then, you know, the native web components came out, which really looks like Java. And I think now it's time to learn. And then I, I started it a couple of times over and over again. And uh, in the first commercial project, we did some proof of concepts and everyone liked that, the web components approach. And then I knew, okay, this, now it's time to invest a little bit more time. But uh, what happened is for me, the new stuff is so similar to Java, you really don't have to learn a lot. So this is what I can tell you. So um, yeah, Merry Christmas, I wish you, Brett. Uh, it was nice times to have you in Munich. And uh, now is everybody remote, so, right? So we have actually the next workshops at Thursday and uh, Thursday and Friday were actually planned to be on Apple Munich, but they are online instead. Okay, now, Mr. Amasianik, no first name, no last name. So even my trick doesn't work. He says, okay, uh, NetBeans doesn't work with Glassfish. And we have a conversation back and forth, and uh, it's really hard to tell why it doesn't work. So what I plan to do, this is NetBeans. Yeah, this is, this is true. So now, what I have here, set up Jakarta EE projects, and I'll call it NetBeans with Payara, NBP, because this was the question. And uh, I try, uh, I answered per email. He asked me about uh, per email. I said, okay, forget it. I, I cannot just tell you this uh, per email, how it works. So now I have a NetBeans with, uh, which opens a folder called junk. You don't have to replicate that. It will also work with folders which are not named junk. Um, it opens. It, uh, takes a way too long time. Let's see what happens. At least we have, um, okay, this should be faster. And uh, by the way, this is a uh, archetype. And let's see whether we will see that. Is it actually visible, the execution? Yeah, the name of the archetype is Jakarta EE Essentials Archetype 007. So you can also execute it from NetBeans, but now I have my project. So. And uh, you asked me about the cargo plugin. I have no idea what cargo plugin does. I also knew it was used back then a long time ago for uh, deployments. I, I don't need cargo. There are two dependencies and this is basically it. Okay, now about Payara, because you asked me about Glassfish. Don't use Glassfish. Glassfish is like open source implementation with lots of bugs. Use Payara It's an alternative. It's this open source alternative with no millions of bucks fixed, and you can even buy commercial support. Great community, so use Payara instead of Glassfish. And I use Glassfish a lot, but five to ten years, years ago, and I consider Payara as a next-gen Glassfish. Okay, so now, install Payara. So um, I do it a lot, so this is my install script for Payara. What you see, what happened was unzip. 
So I just unzipped Payara. What you have to do is you have to set up uh, a Payara home. This is uh, Payara home. Has to be, has to exist. In my case, this is there. And then I can uh, check what is Java 11. And it is. And then I can run the Payara server. So, and... Um, this was the cold start, the very first vanilla start of Payara. And then I created a small tool called Wad SH, which is actually in this case not even necessary. Uh, NBP Wad SH. And it deploys to all servers which are available on my machines. Uh, one of them is Payara. As you can see, uh, it, the application is already deployed. And with curl 8080, uh, NBP, NBP, resources, I hope pink. Uh, so I got 200 from Payara back, and what it, it you saw. Whatever it means, host is not set. Uh, interesting exception, never saw this before. So um, so if this is the, the, the error, uh, I would try to fix it. If this is your um, host is not set. It's interesting why it happens. Ah, I know why it happens. No, <laughs> because the host was not set. <laughs> okay, so you see, and now we have the deployment. So this was from scratch. Of course, what you could do here, I could add the uh, properties. I could uh, run it usually on server, but I don't think I don't have the Payara plugin installed on this uh, NetBeans installation. So if you install the server under services, servers, you can add server and you can add the Glassfish server as Payara and then you can run the application. So if you will watch my older tutorials, uh, this is what, how it is deployed. But behind the scenes, what NetBeans does, it just uh, tells Payara to pick the uh, folder from, from, from target. Okay, so this is the from scratch deployment. And I hope now it's crystal clear. This is what I can do do for you. I, I, I don't like, you know, I have absolutely no time to debug uh, the, uh, what was it, cargo plugin. And I don't think you, you need it. So, okay, now we have it. Yeah, Brett, um, as good as back in Germany. Yeah, you are right. So it was always fun. Um, now, I hope it's crystal clear. So we covered this, and this is also related. This is Cargo Maven related. And now someone asked me, uh, I used, uh, this was Dev DevOx Ukraine, which works well for me. I was able to connect and deliver the workshop. And I use Visual Studio Code. The question is why? And one of the reasons why, uh, oh, I forgot. For instance, let's say this is a project I don't know. I can just make it uh, and open this with Visual Studio Code. And I can very quickly, you know, navigate the project. So um, I, I use uh, Visual Studio Code a lot for code reviews or task forces where the structure is unknown, and I'm not sure whether NetBeans manages or IntelliJ or other tools manages manage to to uh, to deal with the project structure. And and Visual Studio Code is good enough for such cases. For more complex applications, I still prefer NetBeans. Uh, in my commercial projects and some projects I do with Visual Studio Code. It really depends. And I would really like, you know, to code uh, in IntelliJ because I have the license, uh, but um, it works too well with Visual Studio Code and NetBeans, but uh, I plan actually to do so. I use DataGrip, for instance, for database work right now. I really enjoy that. And I would like also to play a little bit with WebStorm, but I hope there, there's no uh, more time to play this year. But um, actually I have to be... 
I have to use whatever works for me and, and be faster. That, that's the problem. The time is the problem. So, okay. The Mr. Uh, Amir Sinik, um, he wrote, like, I think he had some problems with, I don't know, uh, he, he, he wrote several comments and I even deleted some comments because um, it is like, I don't know what happened, but um, his comment was split across several lines. So, now, um, on YouTube, someone asked me uh, regarding to, um, to DTOs, and this is feedback to the last episode. So um, I got a question regarding uh, DAOs and, uh, sorry, DTOs and projections, and this was the Blaze Persistence company uh, I got uh, feedback from. And, uh, and uh, what happened was I recorded a podcast with one of the founders of Blaze Persistence. And what I can tell you is um, what happened was really interesting. So the Blaze Persistence uh, DTO uh, projection framework is not only about creating uh, uh, from entities different DTOs, it also optimizes a lot behind the scenes. So it is better for performance because they are able to create more efficient queries. And the interesting part is what I didn't knew, it runs on Quarkus on native mode. So you can use Blaze Persistence on Quarkus and compile it with GraalVM to native, uh, uh, native, um, how do you call it? Native code, yeah, native image. And I will, I don't think it was the managed this year. I have uh, way too many episodes recorded already waiting to be published with uh, interesting persons actually. And one of them is with, uh, uh, with um, CEO from, from uh, Blaze Persistence. So what I wanted to say is if you, if you have you know, crazy complex persistence and you have entities which have to be mapped to different DTOs uh, and, and should be a high performance project, Blaze Persistence might be interesting and especially if you are using Quarkus. So uh, Mr. I uh, forgot his first name, Christo asked me, um, this, the, the, uh, another question is, how do you decide when to use Redux and when not? Uh, And he asked me, is it always better to start with Redux knowing that the web app will grow? That's the question. So for me, what is the indicator? The indicator is what, and so what is my architecture of, uh, of Redux? So what I do is the following. If we use Redux, everything, the complete entire state is stored in Redux. So no, no exception from that. So this is the cons consequence number one. Number two is, Whatever changes in Redux store, all components get re-rendered. So the question is what we get out of from that is, uh, well, if you have components which display the same data on different screens on different ways, this is where, where Redux shines, right? So, and um, in my current project, this is, not, uh, this is not complex enough, I thought, to have Redux, but uh, there are tables and filtering involved, and this is already... I would say assigned to have Redux. There's also an offline app. So if you have offline app, what can happen if you, you would like to sync the state, you know, with the offline app with the backend. And Redux is also great for that because it holds the entire state. So I would say um, you could absolutely start without Redux and, and edit afterwards, but uh, you have to be careful when is the, you know, the right time to do so. Um, and uh, we already, it, we already, um, um, I, I already discussed the uh, Redux toolkit. I, I don't know whether it is a better success or um, it is. Uh, if you know Redux, you should look at Redux toolkit. Create an hello world with Redux toolkit. And I would say, what I even consider is, for instance, using Redux toolkit but not using the um, I think it's called Action Creator rather than using you know the native action stuff, something like this. So you can you can use Redux toolkit and just use a subset. This makes sense. So then, uh, I would like to announce a new community. Why? Because um, not actually a friend of the show for sure. Uh, um, Heritian Vilenga is uh, behind this portal, and Heritian Vilenga is one of the you know a huge NetBeans how to call it visionaries and uh, one of the uh, NetBeans fanboys I would say, and he runs now a portal called uh, Fuji on Azul systems. And this is like, uh, I would say, um, javablocks.com, it was before. And it's uh, like a portal, news portal, 
for open jdk news and um and uh, also interesting kevin farnham from o'reilly um it was actually a funny story um and my one of my first java ones it was 2007 2000 no my first was 2007 a speaker the very first one was 2000 um it was 2008 i think um kevin ran the o'reilly booth and kevin um invited me to a podcast it was java.net podcast about episode about my java one session which was how i hacked my heating control with java e5 and actually not only hacked my heating control i improved the efficiency of the uh, heating control and uh, for other reasons kevin remembered me and uh, he picked me and said hey now you have a podcast and i i invited him back after 13 years and uh, this episode and, and and kevin is also in charge of fuji right now so i say okay i would like you know to promote fuji because it's a great community and um and it's a community around um, open jdk which is nice so focus community okay uh perfect vandra 2097 as i remember the vandra was on the meetup meet uh by the way uh, what we also should do we should well welcome all the attendees from meetup ahex.com this is this uh all 23 attendees so you are welcome and what i wanted to, to say to meetup so what i do with the meetup is if i know a conference which is going to be online i announce it on meetup here first because um yeah there's a nice community and i think someone could be interested in it but what I usually do is if you go to, let's say this is tomorrow, Jakarta E and MicroProfile, good parts and free session. So if you go here, you will find a link. So this is what I can sometimes do, not always. Uh, I can sometimes give you a direct link to the streaming, but sometimes not possible. For instance, here you will have to register. So if you see me, you know, referring to third party conferences, uh, check the link about the dates and time because sometimes it changes and sometimes if I announce the event I don't have the uh, the time and date for instance um, I think on Wednesday there's another the feel of next generation cloud native runtimes event with 50 uh, 50 attendees this is the same so I got you know the uh, the um, time of this event uh, time you see to be done last week so i will update that but you can please always use you know the links to be sure when it happens so the links are always right okay perfect so 50 50 and this is just uh, amazing um so and uh wanderer asked a comment at the last event and i said okay just you know ask questions at the uh, jlf conference which i couldn't attend for <laughs> stupid reasons but now he, he has the uh, opportunity to ask more questions so um he's an um what suggestion do you have for a java developer looking to learn javascript in order to get in, into the front end world what 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 i'm pretty sure about so at the beginning you are overwhelmed of the entire tools for instance for me at the beginning in javascript world i couldn't explain why they are compiling the stuff so i always know they are they are speaking about compilation and transpilations like what the hell happens in javascript world why they have to compile their stuff because I, I started actually with javascript and java at the same time and i never had to compile anything it just run run in the browser back then so um i'm i'm going even further i'm not only sticking to standards and avoiding framework i also um avoid any unnecessary build tools so rollup js is the necess necessary evil to sometimes integrate external libraries i don't use rollup for my project for my project right now which is which is supposed to to behave like a native application which is what is built in web components which can be installed from a central portal um and i'm not i'm using this without npm so exactly what i did in the course is uh, browser sync and roll up uh for external external components so i would say um just use visual studio code if you have visual studio code and visual studio code loads javascript in behind the scenes it actually uses typescript so it gets a, a kind of good uh, auto completion without doing anything and um what uh, at the beginning what will happen sometimes you run into an error and for me it is not as bad because i had the problem 
as I started with Java, there was no working code completion in most editors and it was not very good. And what we couldn't do reliably is to rename things. So JavaScript right now is better than Java at the beginning. So what I can tell you, I would just try it. If it doesn't work at all, then I would try the same approach with TypeScript. TypeScript is a bit dangerous because it's a superset of JavaScript. So you could do things which are not available in JavaScript yet. So, yeah. And now he asked me about the order of my uh, of my online workshops. And if you are, you know, Java developer who would like, you know, to start as fast as possible, start with the latest course, but I, I'm just building the application from scratch. But I think you can understand what's going on. So the um, this one is just one, this, for instance, like this, but without Redux, it's just, you know, creating a simple application with all the technologies is similar to in what I did in Jakarta E, this would be the effective and this would be the bootstrap. So this is a less structured than this one. And this just, you know, covers all the web components API and this, and this one, all the web standards like CSS, all the layouts and stuff like that. So if you have time, go from this up to that, if you have no time and you are motivated to learn something quickly, just use this recent one. This is what I would suggest you. Okay. Hope so. So the next one. In Wanderer, one thing, please write shorter queries because I, I, will, yeah, I read them once, but I have to reread them again, which is hard because you are watching me and uh, I have to be responsive. Otherwise, you would think I'm deadlocked. So, um, and uh, what I think what we would like to express here, uh, what if you, you, you need inheritance? And uh, what you already saw is that uh, the entity uh, inheritance is likely, which, uh, which, which indeed sometimes it happens in, in the current projects. So we have JP entities with inheritance and my current projects even with behavior. It is less likely in boundary and, and control level. But if you really would like to have inheritance on boundary and you can justify that. So um, you are speaking here about uh, generic managers. And um, and by the way, you see if writing 100 managers and resources get old, odd, fast. So what I think, what you don't see is what I see me in the YouTube, so you know, I have a resource and I have a boundary. In a project, the uh, I think the last uh, micro profile, how it's called, um, Microprofile applications, the last, well, let's see, um, AXIO, uh, Microprofile apps, this is the course. So in the last course, I built a more realistic application, which I actually planned to put in production. It was to my, supposed to replace my block. And you see there that the resources have different signature than the managers or boundaries. The reason being is because, and this is going even worse, because uh, in production, the... Um, the resource will also introduce, you know, um, e tags and um, how it's called cache control headers. And uh, this is the idea, and the boundaries are, are going to be just uh, logic free. So, um, and I would say this is not the case. So, um, this boundary control entity is used in lots of commercial projects, and there's no problem with it. And, and um, what I saw in one project, it was actually huge. What they managed to do is to have uh, boundaries annotated with Jack Suarez annotations they didn't have to use, you know, the cache control and e header. So they, they they just skipped the boundary or, or the manager part uh, completely. So, but if you really find something for inheritance and boundary level, what I would do is I would create a top level component called, um, called uh, how to call it, persistence or whatever you find your cross-cutting cross-cutting concern which can be inherited and this top level component would uh, would in boundary package will be an abstract boundary and all other components will inherit from the boundary this this would be all and i would create a package info.java and, and just you know, write down why this boundary is uh is uh, an abstract class yeah and the gateway pattern is less common right now it could come back because it requires stateful Thank you for reading my green book, uh, uh, Stateful Architecture. And uh, I didn't use it for a long time because right now everything is restful. So now the next one, what I understood here, one ear, two jars. I would never do that. Two wars is the way to go. So uh, don't put two jars in one ear. 
put two words which are independent. So let's say I have two words. This is even worse. How to you know how they should communicate with each other. And what you would like to do is to, um, you need uh, something something like compensative transactions. What I understood is you would like to ship, and if the ship fails, you would like to get the money back. And um, you already mentioned event. In this particular case, Kafka would be great. This is the great use of Kafka because Kafka would just say, say you know, this is shipped and this is like it is, and the other service will react to it. And if you would like, you know, to, uh, to I don't know how to call it, um, reject a payment, you just create, you, you will, how to move, move forward, uh, fall back forward, <laughs> fall, fall forward, how to call it. So um, you would like, you know, just to add new functionality and not try, you know, to undo the, uh, the transactions. This is, this is the way to go. So in your particular case, just create compensative transactions. If you ship something and the client cannot pay, send him an email, right? Or it would be better to charge him first. And if it doesn't work, don't ship. Um, this this would be uh, the um, the the order of events matters. But if you read that, it it looks for me like Kafka. CDI events would work. So another option would be get rid of jars, get rid of ears, put everything to one war, and then you can use CDI events synchronously because they understand transactions, then this is simple. Then I, you would have two modules. It would be shipping and billing. To have two packages, top-level packages, shipping and billing, and do, they can exchange uh, CDI events or just, yeah, CDI events. Uh, because you would like to be decoupled, then use just CDI, out, CDI events. JMS, less convenient than Kafka. And outbox, outbox pattern is uh, like a table. This is like workaround. If you don't like Kafka, you could use outbox. But just introducing Kafka for two jars is too much. Then use outbox pattern. But uh, something like event streaming, this is what you would like to do. You need not JMS. You need the opposite. You need a database with a history of events which moves forward. That, that's what you need. Okay. WonderOS is uh, hyperactive today. So... um. How would you go about fulfilling dynamic entity projections? Okay, so first, take a look at the data or it's called Blaze Persistence. It is already interesting. Then you already on investigated with JSON P, which uh, is the way to go. What you can use is, uh, forgot actually to uh, J um, Adam, oh, Adam Bean, J Bean is also nice, uh, JSON Pointer. You could actually use JSON pointer to extract fragments from documents, which I did recently, which will also works is probably not as convenient. And uh, 11 years ago, uh, there should be um, JX path. You could do the same on object level. So JX path, Jakarta Commons uh, JX path is a framework where you can follow, you know, details and gather the data here. So, um, so, but if you would like to be really flexible, I would say you will need something like um, uh, hash map, which is basically JSONP. Okay, so, but uh, for you, take a look at Blaze Persistence. This could be interesting. So now, uh, oh, I forgot to look it up. This is a new, I forgot something. And... Um, and uh, he says, I was I was willing to upgrade my uh, Java X Java E to Jakarta E, and this IMAP and, and Java Mail was missing, and um, and he provided Jakarta Mail. So I'm not sure whether it is intentional, and uh, maybe Jakarta Mail beca became optional. So I forgot to look it up. Um, 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 but uh, our, my uh, workshops applications, actually, so if you register to workshops to get an email, it is created by Jakarta Mail, and I remember it worked, but I use properly the Java E still uh, dependency. Um, so it would be interesting um, whether Jakarta Mail became optional in Jakarta E 8 API. We could actually, let's, let's see, Jakarta E specifications, Mail. Let's see a hint. And should be a part of it. So um, it will be interesting to see. 
So um what should we do? Write a mail to the mailing list, Jakarta E. This would be an interesting exercise. Or I would try to find it out and uh um and uh tell you, you know the news in the next 80 second uh edition of AX TV. But um you're right. I also don't like the fact that I have two dependencies now, micro profile and Jakarta E. And uh yeah. I don't think you are wrong. So if you have to do it, do it, and we have to investigate why why it's necessary. So there's a nice um, article I got here. It's a German one. Unit is for C CDI and Eclipse Microbus in German. So I read the article, and this is they create a small framework which provides uh, CDI tests or CDI testing capabilities in unit tests, and they say uh, the um, the uh, Spring Boot or Spring Framework does that, and Jakarta E cannot deliver. And um, what I have to tell, um, I actually, uh, I sometimes we have developers on Spring Boot which use Java E, and they try always try to start a server and unit tests, and I say, okay, we don't need it, and we really don't need it. So in JUnit tests, it must not be necessary to launch the server. For integration tests, it's different thing. So, but having said that, uh, Helidon and Quarkus both framework support injection in integration test phase. So this comes already with the runtime. So you get it for free. And um, if you don't get it for free, I actually evaluated all the possibilities in Java e testing framework. So I use the CDI unit, I use the Delta Spike. Um, and what you should know is that in the recent Java EE8 or Jakarta e 8 versions, you can launch CDI there is an official Java SE bootstrap for CDI. So it, this is like official way how to bootstrap Java SE, which is good enough. And for um, for most projects, uh, it is absolutely not necessary to, uh, to have to rely on CD CDI dependency injection during, um, during unit test. And uh, listen to the podcast, EHXFM podcast. Let's see. And uh, unit test consider considered harmful, where we had a, a one-hour conversation with a .NET developer, which was actually a nice one because uh, um, you know to compare both worlds, where we say, okay, this this unit test is completely overestimated. You should focus more on black box testing. Yeah, and uh, forgot even to mention. So um, so the podcasts are also doing great. So like it is getting more and more popular. And the last episode was with Vlad Mihalcha again. This is, you know, the persistence guy. And we also had with, uh, we had uh, the AHEX TV uh, episodes. I got lots of questions uh, regarding Juke. And I had actually the opportunity to interview Lucas Ada or a chat with him about how he created Juke, why he created Juke, which was, um, and at the end, we spent, I would say, 15 minutes just talking commercial support, dependency on Juke. What can go wrong? What happens if Lucas either disappears on on an island on Hawaii? So this was the discussion with uh, with uh, Lucas, and I think this was also prior. Yeah, it was uh, November the fifteenth discussion with Ruslan uh, Sinitsky about how he created uh, how he became a cloud provider. Also interesting one. Also really fun. Uh, yeah. Okay. Now. Uh, no podcast. Back to the questions. Okay, and um, yeah, I, I would say uh, we have a, we have a, a lots of episodes already in the AHX FM part, uh, pipeline. But um, yes, I would actually li like to ask Guna, and I almost invited Guna Morling <laughs> of the Bizium to this. Uh, yeah. Uh, in in 2021, I will do it. I think this year is over. Yeah. Now, again, he, Christo from Irvine. Uh, I created Jotonizer, yes, for test purposes. And and he asked me, you know, um, makes looks like an easy job initially, but I fear things get tough when you realize you need. So, yeah. Um, or do you recommend external providers such as Okta, AWS, Cogito? What first? Uh, the the first idea is Kicklock. It is like um, um, everyone everyone likes Kicklock. It's easy to install, and um, 
is also used in JavaScript projects. So Keyclog is great because it's open source. You can run it on uh, on your machine, and it comes with all this mentioned here. And um, then um, the uh, Keyclog comes with a I think it's called Gatekeeper or Gateway. It's a small Go library which already does you know the entire uh, OpenID Connect flow. And um, so then the next one Okta, yeah. Okta would be interesting. They are also very. It's a vibrant uh, community. On AWS, you could use Cogito, but then you are really dependent on the, on the, on the cloud. Which, if you are an AWS shop, Cogito also works nice. Um, or in one project we use, uh, I think it was called um, ADS, uh, Active Directory Services from Microsoft. We use it was on uh, on prem. It was already installed and worked great. And you can also use the same in the cloud from Microsoft. So. If I had a choice between Microsoft and AWS, I would probably choose Asia Cloud um, because, you know, most of the... Yeah, this is... Um, yeah, and I don't know the German Kratos. So let's see what the Kratos are doing. It looks already German. So, um, yeah, a nice one. I will have to check it. So thank you for the link. Um, we have to double check that. So, and what do your clients usually end up doing? So my clients, uh, most of my clients are using uh, Keycloak or they're using whatever they had. So all these single sign-on solutions, uh, my clients have uh, provide OpenID Connect and this is the problem. So the problem is not the JSON web token. So you can always create a token. The problem is the flow. What you would like to have is you need a login form. You know, uh, you get redirected and this is self-registration is less uh, important because uh, the data is usually maintained in my clients in LDAP and stuff like that. And startups, in my startups project, we always used Keycloak. And uh, yeah. And um, I already thought about implementing the OpenID Connect by myself for smaller projects, but no time for that. Okay, so. Next one. In your classes, you recommend to manage locally your ES6 assets with Snowpack and Rollup. I started with Rollup, Snowpack, and now I fall back to Rollup again because it's simpler. However, it's no more, not more economical to use free CDNs and lower your AWS network bill instead. So, AWS network bill. I think for my podcasts, which become more and more popular, this is actually uh, AWS, and I forgot how much it is, but... Um, for all my podcasts, I get monthly bill, I think 40 or 50 euros or something like this. And these are podcasts. So one podcast is big, like 50 max. So if you have assets, what I have, I don't, I don't think it is more than, so my, this has to be significantly less than 50 euros a month. So, and also my projects are not my projects. They're usually my clients' projects. And uh, what's more interesting is, you know, the reliability. So the CDN has to be always available and we have to control it. And uh, in, in my clients usually have their own CDN. So they, they buy uh, CloudFront or Akamai. So they have already contracts with the providers. And this is what we use. And the bandwidth, bandwidth was, as I remember, it was really never an issue. And that uh, bandwidth costs. So uh, for my startups, uh, currently we, I will probably use either, um, I'm not sure, either Lambda or Fargate in one uh, startup project. And uh, it, 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 this is the app I told you, and uh, I don't think it, it matters, the bandwidth cost at all. But having said that, so Skypack looks interesting. So I took a look at that and never used that in production. But this is even more, import maps, um, they are really great standards on the horizon. Because what it allows you is to map, um, where is it? Here. To map imports to whatever you like. And you can even map imports to an external URI, which exactly what we need in uh, in micro frontends, right? So because I can tell you locally, go to Node.js and, and on, the, on, on the client or in browser, go to, you know, to, um, or yeah, in production, go to external service. So... Oh, no, 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 no. Very good. Um, so what I think, what, what we do a lot is a different thing. 
So what you saw in the course was the rollup JS that we create a JavaScript file, a single one or, or, or a view. This, this we push to a central HTTP web server. And this web server belongs to my clients. And all the applications can share this common library where we actually can cache something. And this is what happens. And uh, what we deliver is very Jakarta-istic way, right? What we deliver is just our app and, and all the common common utilities, there's no frameworks, Co common libraries are in central location. And we import not from a dot slash rather than HTTP, my web server slash and so forth. Now, Mike Edgar from Cleveland created something remarkable. So this is actually a great community here. Um, this is, I would say, uh, I learned more and more from EHX, uh, EHX TV. So instead of answering questions here, I will actually, this will be my uh, Adam Bean learning show, right? So first, he found something really interesting, JSON API, which looks promising. The question is how to evaluate with something could fly or not. And um, what's interesting here with JSON API is Yehuda Katz is behind this thing. And um, Yehuda Katz is the guy who created Sprout Core and Ember.js. And uh, Sprout Core is the um, framework Apple uses behind the scenes to implement uh, how it's called the um, iCloud.com, I think. Right? Is it something like this? iCloud.com? This is the iCloud.com, and this was built with Sprout Core. Now, hopefully, still Sprout Core, something else. And Sprout Core is the first version, and then came, and then came um, AmberJS. Okay, and this already looks um, promising because it's readable, and uh, old data is not as readable, right? <laughs> so. Um, but uh, 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 but um, and what this reminds me is um, how it's called. Um, Eclipse link, Jax Restful. There was a project. Exactly. So this is like this was a project from Eclipse link where you can uh, traverse what if you install that it's basically a servlet. You can traverse Eclipse Link uh, JPA objects via RESTful web services, which is really convenient. And if you take a look at this URIs and this URIs, they might be similar. So point being is, uh, we don't need this and we don't need this anymore. And this is also covered, covered, uh, covered, covered. Okay, the next one. So, um, and... So... And what Edgar did, it created a great little API or library called JSON RP RVP. And JSON RP is several implementation using Jaxor as bin validation and Java persistence. And uh, it looks promising, promising and, and didn't have time to try it out. But it um, this is a great idea because this is what I also would, if I, 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 if I would have such a need, I would take, take a look at the spec and try to implement the spec. Now, why? Because it's faster. So um, to tell you a short story. You probably know, you know the uh, uh, JCA Java Connector architecture, and um, it was uh, it was supposed um, to um, to extend the application servers with third party connectors, and there was a common like you know in the community say okay it's complicated and whatever, and I was in a project with um, in a beginner project with Java developers. And they asked me, you know, we would like to talk to other system, which has to be transactional. And I said, okay, if you would like to do that, there's a JCA spec, maybe you could look at that and try to implement that. And um, so after a few weeks, I came back and they implemented the entire connector. And I asked them, wow, not bad. You you, you are you know beginner and you implemented JCA connector. So yeah, it was very simple. You know, the interface is already there. We were nice documented. We didn't have to design anything. We just implemented the interface and we're ready to go. So this is why uh, it can be very productive to, 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 to base, you know, your uh, applications on standards. Looks promising. I didn't try that yet. But um, yeah, if it looks nice, so we should, I'm not logged in. So everyone from the show 
should start the project first because it's really nice. And um, Xlate, um, you're welcome to my podcast. We can discuss, you know, why you need that or Mike Etka. Uh, if you like, um, ping me and I would like to invite you to uh, AXFM next year. So this year is over. So it's crazy times. Okay. Uh, this was from Mike Etka. And uh, the O data is not, so what is the, the GraphQL is like more or less standard, which is not very restful. O data is restful, but a little bit strange naming conventions in my, for one of my current projects, they are forced to use um, O data uh, from the Java perspective and to use O data from Java microservice to consume O data is a little bit complicated. To consume all data from JavaScript perspective or front-end um, perspective is very easy. and uh, But this is really a nice approach. So um, I have no time to play with it, uh, hopefully in January. If not, ping me again, but probably someone from the show could just try it. We have no vacations uh, around the corner. Just try it. Uh, Dap, this is from Moscow, Dimitri. Ask me, I watch your latest videos and I'm interested in a question about REST client fault. So what he would like to do is a, a job scheduler, which pushes, uh, invokes clients. And if the client fails, uh, the data must not get lost. This is the idea. How to implement that? And um, so what, do you, what should happen is the client has to be idempotent. This is what I will do. So if the job scheduler recognizes that the client is not available, it should retry that. So how to do that? What it could do is you could use MicroProfile REST client and the retry happens automatically if you put the retry annotation on it. And this will be my approach. So I use uh, MicroProfile REST client with the bulkhead pattern. And uh, sorry, bulkhead pattern, a retry pattern. Um, I'm thinking of a global flag that stores client state information, maybe failover has more elegant solutions. So the item potence will be the best one than to just retry until it can get delivered. Otherwise, you you will end up having something like topic, uh, how is it called, uh, JMS, uh, durable topic, and this uh, is harder to implement. You will need a database uh, behind the scenes. Okay, almost done. Uh, DHPI 11 hours ago, uh, what he would like to do is, um, he would like to have a building code where that our data models in different layers of the application, which are very much alike. So similar data, and this causes a lot of boilerplate code and unit tests, which is, which is hard to maintain. Yes. Um, so how to map them generate is, I think, bad idea. If you can, if you can generate something is, is, uh, usually means is, is superfluous. So it's like why to do that and um so what you get is again blaze persistence or there were frameworks like uh, doza um, but the problem with such approaches is they always work well if the two layers are almost identical which might be the case in your case so the doza project is almost like uh but what I've wrote a blog post is if doza work, works well in your project you have a design problem because the, uh, you are copying identical layers back and forth. Then there is another uh, interesting mapping framework called Mapstruct from Gunnar Molling. It's the same guy who created DBZU, uh, also interesting one. And I would not use code generation because uh, Blaze Persistence was the projection, also a nice way. And, um, and uh, the code generation is a little bit odd because you are du duplicating the code is not dry. Okay, so, and now this is the HPI. Hans, pick him up, ask me. Um, I want to be able to configure for a user how many requests per second uh, he can fire onto my server. And my server then should return the number of possible requests in a response header. And of course, my server should return HTTP response code 429. This, this might be harder. When the max number request is uh, depleted. So, how to do that? So, um, almost done except 429 and the um, annotation is called bulkhead bulkhead and if you take a look at the annotation what you see is the bulkhead value in waiting task queue 
So what you can do is, if you have a critical section in the system, you can annotate with bulkhead. Value 5 means just 5 threads, and waiting task queue 8 means there is a room for 8 uh, tasks. What you can do then, now it comes. We, we even manage 4 to 9. We can have a bulkhead asynchronous and an annotation called fallback. And fallback could call another method, which will raise web application exception, which uh, provides you the status of four to nine. But the interesting part is the bulkhead pattern contributes to microprofile metrics. So if the other client asks metrics slash application, you will get back the state of the bulkhead. You will see, you know, whether the waiting task queue is full or not. And I would argue if there is already something in the waiting task queue, the server is overloaded. So this is I should be good enough and you don't have to pro perform any coding at all. So I hope we are done. So uh, we are done. So if you really would like to attend AHEX Live, um, the next show is going to be March and uh, the next workshops will be after March, maybe the same week. I don't even know when March the 23rd is. Maybe the same week, but I guess uh, in April or May will be the next AX Live remote workshops. Okay, we covered everything. Let's see what happens in the chat. Where is my beautiful chat? Okay, where is my chat? I lost my chat. My beautiful window. Regardless. So now the question is, uh, I see myself, which is really disturbing. Um, Jakarta mail dependence optional in the Jakarta package. Yeah, it seems like. Is JSON IP a new SOAP? I don't think JSON API provides the schema and uh, the SOAP was more than just, you know, messaging. So this, the SOAP was crazy. So, but you're right. So now, um, so this is why I would like ask uh, Edgar, uh, Mike, uh, Mike, uh, what's his name? I think Mike Edgar. In a podcast, we can discuss why he created this the thing. So read this. So okay, now I think we are done. We should use the chat more. Let's see whether there's an API here, but uh, it is usable. I would say thank you for watching. See you at AHEX Live upcoming conferences uh, this week too. This is the um, go to meetup. This is the next generation uh, Java Cloud runtimes. I can tell you that uh, I will probably show you uh, Open Liberty a little bit and a little bit more Helidon and also Quarkus, right? So this is the next generation and explain why this is next generation. And uh, tomorrow is the uh, Jakarta One live stream where um, I will just hack something Jakarta EE and MicroProfile together. Um, yeah so i would say thank you good night good morning and uh yeah see you next time in 2021 bye